Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to Worship at St. John's. If you couldn't tell, I am not Pastor Beauvais. I am Ben Hofferman. I am the staff ministry intern here under Pastor Gunther for my final semester at MLC. Today we are in the four, we are in Lent and we are on the fourth Sunday in Lent. And we have heard how scripture shows us that we are sinners in this world through temptations, the cross, distraction, distraction from the heart of worship. But today we will see the solution for those fail failures as heard in our sermon. We follow service setting too. One note is that the Kyrie will be spoken and not sung. May God bless our worship today as we begin with hymn 581. Please stand. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Blessed are they whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Blessed are they whose sin the Lord does not count against them. Let us confess our sins to the Lord. Almighty and merciful Father, we have strayed from your ways like lost sheep. We have followed what we have devised and desired in our hearts. We have offended you and sinned against your holy law. We have done those things that we should not have done, and we have not done those things that we should have done. Have mercy on us, Lord. Spare us, forgive us, and restore us according to your promises in Christ Jesus. God, our merciful Father, has forgiven all our sins. He sent his Son, Jesus Christ, 
to be our Redeemer and Savior. Jesus paid the penalty for our guilt by his death on the cross and freed us from death by his resurrection from the grave. We have peace with God now and forever. Amen. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For this holy house, and for all who offer, hear their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Grant, O merciful Lord, to your faithful people pardon and peace, that they may be cleansed from all their sins and serve you with a quiet mind. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The congregation may be seated. Our first lesson comes from he Numbers chapter 21, beginning at verse 4, where we hear that even though the Israelites' lives were difficult, their complaints were a slap in the face of a gracious God who rescued them from slavery in Egypt and provided for them in the desert. Therefore, the Lord disciplined his people by sending snakes into their camp. We read, They traveled from Mount Hor along the route to the sea to go around Edom, but the people grew impatient on the way. They spoke against God and against Moses and said, Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? There is no bread, there is no water, and we detest this miserable food. Then the Lord sent venomous snakes among them. They bit the people and many Israelites died. The people came to Moses and said, we sinned when we spoke against the Lord and against you. Pray that the Lord will take the snakes away from us. So Moses prayed for the people. The Lord said to Moses, Make a snake and put it up on a pole. Anyone who is bitten can look at it and live. So Moses made a bronze snake and put it up on a pole. Then, when anyone was bitten by a snake and looked at the bronze snake, they lived. The word of the Lord. Be to God. In place of the psalm, we will sing hymn 657, Baptismal Waters Cover Me.
Our second lesson is Paul's letter to the Ephesians, chapter 2. This will also serve as our sermon text for this morning. As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins, in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms of Christ Jesus, in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For it is by grace you have been saved, through faith, and this not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. The word of the Lord. Please stand for the reading of the gospel. Today's gospel is found in John chapter 3, beginning at verse 14. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that everyone who believes may have eternal life in him. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already because they have not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. This is the verdict. Light has come into the world, but people loved darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. Everyone who does evil hates the light and will not come into the light for fear that their deeds will be exposed. But whoever lives by the truth comes into the light so that it may be seen plainly that what they have done has been done in the sight of God. The Gospel of the Lord. We continue with the hymn of the day, hymn number 575, By Grace I'm Saved. The congregation may be seated.
Grace, mercy, and peace are yours. From God our Father, through our Lord, and our Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, the man had been working in his basement on this project tirelessly for months. His assistant did all of the dirty work, but he did all of the technical work. And finally, after painstaking hours and hours of labor of stitching together those rotting body parts, he was ready to see what would happen. He went over to the oversized switch on the wall and threw it down, and thousands of volts of electricity surged through the corpse laying on the table. And first it, it lurched and jolted, and then it sat up, and then it groaned, ah. Uh. And the mad scientist shouted with delight, it's alive, it's alive, it's alive. All right, it kind of sounds like a B-grade horror film when we hear the scene before us today that the Apostle Paul talks about the dead coming to life. Of course, he's not talking about Frankenstein's monster, but something far greater, far more miraculous about those who are spiritually dead coming back to life by a power far greater than a few thousand volts of electricity, by the power of God's grace working in us. A grace that brings the spiritually dead to life. You and I, friends, were once spiritually dead. We could do no more for ourselves spiritually than a rotting corpse could do for itself physically. But when we deserved nothing but the wrath of God, God in his grace brought us to life. And we are alive. We are truly alive, alive by God's grace, and we are alive in God's grace, able to live for him each day. Our text for consideration today is from what I call the great zombie chapter of Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 10. So do you like watching zombie movies, movies about the living dead, or maybe the TV series The Walking Dead? Those zombies seem to be alive, at least they're moving around and they're walking about, but they're not really alive, are they? They're dead. And all they want to do is to consume, to hurt, to kill, whatever it takes for them to feed on the brains of the living. They don't care who they hurt along the way. They don't care what harm comes to the neighborhood or to others. It's all they do. Serve themselves. Well, as unflattering as it may sound, that's exactly what the Apostle Paul says you and I were once like spiritually. As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you used to live, the living dead, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. We were by nature deserving of wrath. We were the living dead. In fact, in the Greek, the word for walk around, the word for which you used to live could literally be translated walk around, peripateo. We were the walking dead, once lying in the grave of sin, rotting in our filth and stinking, unable to climb out, unable to call for help, unable to do anything to help ourselves because we were dead. Like the living dead, we could go about the tasks of our day-to-day -day affairs. Like the walking dead, all we did was hurt others to get what we wanted. Serving self, serving our sinful cravings, only serving others if there was something we thought we could get from them by it, manipulating and harming. We stunk of the rot of our sinful natures, of the of the restless gossip, of the cruel backstabbing, of the selfish behaviors time and again, the anger and the malice that we showed to others, the shameful things that we did, our shameful thoughts known only to God, dead, lifeless, rotting corpses, unable to do anything good spiritually. That's what we were. But God. What beautiful words those two words are. 
when we were lifeless and powerless, but God. But God, who is rich in mercy, brought us to life. He didn't leave us as corpses, and not with the electricity of a defibrillator, but with his powerful grace. With water and the word, with the proclamation of some shepherd that he spoke through, with his love, with his mercy, by his grace. That love that he's shown to you, though none of us deserve it, but because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. When we were incapable of producing a single good work before God, he saw our wretched situation. And moved by his seemingly incomprehensible love for rotting corpses, he acted. He sent his own son, who alone deserved to truly live in the glory of heaven, so that he might come and die. And because the living died, the dead can come to life. Because Jesus lived a perfect life in our place and became the sacrifice for our sin. The sinless Son of God lived a blameless life, keeping every one of God's commandments, and then he took the blame for every one of our sinful thoughts and words and actions on himself and endured hell on a cross to pay for it all. And now all of our guilt has been exchanged for all of his holiness. What do we need to do to be saved? Nothing. We can do nothing. But we don't have to do a single thing, not even the faith that trusts in these promises is something we take credit for. That too is a gift of God, a gift by the Holy Spirit working in us. We receive the blessings of the cross. All is a gift, something unearned, when we were dead and incapable of faith. God made us alive. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this not from yourselves. It is the gift of God. Or as Martin Luther put it so well in his explanation to the third article, I believe that I cannot by my own thinking or choosing believe in Jesus Christ my Lord or come to him. But the Holy Spirit has called me by the gospel, enlightened me with his gifts. He's kept me in the true faith. In the same way he calls, gathers, enlightens, and keeps the whole Christian church on earth in the one true faith. We who were once spiritually dead and bound to die forever in hell, like the living dead, never able to fully die, but would keep on living and suffering and regret, have had God act. But God. And we've been made alive, not by anything we've done, but made alive by grace alone. And now, now we can truly live, because we are not just alive by grace, we are alive in grace. When Paul describes God bringing the dead to life, the result is not a bunch of rotting body parts stitched together in some monstrosity that Dr. Frankenstein made in his basement. No. Instead, when God makes us spiritually alive, he makes us rich with life. Lives that can sing and dance and praise God and give glory to him in all that we do as we live in this grace each day. Paul goes on, God who is rich in mercy made us alive with Christ. God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. In order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. You see, God didn't just take us out of the grave so we can wander around in the graveyard. He took us out of the graveyard altogether. In John 10.10, Jesus said, I have come that they, that is his sheep, his followers, may have life and have it to the full. We're no longer destined to just wander around aimlessly like zombies in this dreary world. We know that we will go to heaven to be with our Savior. And that truth helps us to live in God's grace right now. And what a life it is, because in this Christian church, he daily and fully forgives all sins to me and all believers. You and I, dear friends, now have the incredible privilege of living every moment of our lives in thanks to the one who made us alive. For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, 
which God prepared in advance for us to do. We are God's creation. And as such, we're not just some collection of body parts. No, we are God's masterpiece. His work of art in which his glory is displayed in our lives as we live for him. He has shaped us, to be sure, by water and by the word and by the challenges of life, but he has made us who we are and given each of us opportunities that surround us each day that we get the privilege of choosing from and how we might best serve him in the next moments. He's created good works for us to do. So what constitutes a good work? Well, my catechism students know that a good work must meet two criteria. It must be driven by the right attitude, namely gratitude to God for what he's done for us in Christ. And secondly, it must be the right action, namely something that God tells us he wants us to do according to his word. And so a good work, then, is any act of loving kindness performed out of thanks to God and in service to our neighbor. A young stay-at-home mom once put a sign above the kitchen sink that said, Worship services held here three times daily. It was her way of reminding herself that as she did the dishes with joy in her heart and service to her Savior, these were good works that she could perform. She showed her gratitude to what Jesus had done for her. She was really living with her life, alive in every way. Have you ever been on a vacation and said to yourself, now this is the life? Well, in view of God's great grace for us and bringing us to life when we were spiritually dead, we can say that every day, even when we're not on vacation. Because it transforms all of those mundane tasks into acts of worship. Driving the kids to school under the speed limit, of course, and not yelling at them when they're getting cranky in the back. is an act of worship to your Savior when done out of love for him. Being kind to your spouse even when he or she is being irritable because you love Jesus is an act of worship to him. Doing your homework to the best of your ability even when you'd rather be playing video games because you want to bring glory to God, to thank him for what he's done, is a good work. Answering those emails or making yourself available to that person who seems so needy so much of the time, even when you'd rather just shut off your phone, is an act of worship to your Savior when done out of love and thanks to Him. All of these become more than just mundane tasks. They're good works that God has prepared for us to do. And when we do them in view of the cross and in thanks to our Savior, then we can say, Now this is the life. Remember, friends, what you once were. Spiritually dead, lifeless corpses, zombies just wandering about, consuming and craving. And Remember what you are. Spiritually alive in every way. Already seated with Christ in the heavenly realms, brought to life not by your efforts nor by your decision, but entirely by God's grace with the privilege of living a life of thanks to him in this life of grace. And as you continue to live your life in thanks to him, then you will really live. Then you will live life to the full. In Jesus' name, dear friends, you are alive. Amen. I invite you to stand. May our Lord of peace himself give you peace at all times and in every way by the life given you in Christ our Savior. Amen. Having heard of God's grace given us in Christ, we now join together to encourage each other by confessing the faith that we mutually share. This morning we'll use the words of the Apostles' Creed as they're found on page 181. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. 
I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. The congregation may be seated as we continue our service with the prayer of the church. Before we continue with the responsive prayer on page 182, we offer several prayers of intercession. We pray. Merciful Father, we pray on behalf of the family of Bryce Kerfock, the grandfather of our staff ministry intern, Ben Hofferman. He passed away this last week. Take into your care those whose hearts are so affected by his death and lead them to look to you for confidence and strength to face the future. Sustain them with your merciful hand and grant them your peace for the sake of Jesus, our Savior and Redeemer. We also pray for the family of Pastor Gerhard Schapakam, the brother of our members Ruth Barch and Judy Schreer. He also passed away this last week. We praise you for making him your child in baptism and for the blessings you brought to your church throughout his life of service. Help us always live in joyful anticipation of the day when you will call us from our graves, reunite us to you, and fill us with perfect peace and joy in your presence forever. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. And we continue on page 182. Eternal Lord, give us peace as we ponder the good news that you forgive our sins in Christ. Lead us to see clearly the path you have laid out for us. Provide courage and compassion to all who preach and teach your word. Fill them with a love like yours as they proclaim your grace to us and all people. Guard and guide the families of our congregation. Lead husbands and wives to love each other with commitment, respect, and patience. Help parents to grasp the eternal value of keeping their children close to Jesus all their lives. Grant joy to those who are single and make them a blessing to others. Provide wisdom and insight to those who make laws and set policies. Give us respect for those who protect us from crime. Lead us to value the rights of our fellow citizens and to defend those who cannot defend themselves. Give us passion to share the story of your love with our family and friends. Overcome unbelief and open the hearts of people everywhere to believe the good news that Jesus has forgiven their sins and opened the gates of heaven. Extend your healing power to those who are sick and suffering in body or mind. Give patience and compassion to all who care for the sick and dying. Lift the eyes of the distress of your love in Christ. Hear us, Lord, as we pray in silence. Gracious God, you govern and direct all things, and you love all people. Hear our prayers, spoken and silent, and answer them in your wisdom and grace. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We continue our service now as we offer, gather our offerings in response to God's grace that has made us so alive.
We continue our service with the singing of hymn 560, Your Works Not Mine, O Christ. Please stand for prayer. We pray. Almighty God, we thank you for teaching us the things you want us to believe and do. Help us by your Holy Spirit to keep your word in pure hearts that we may be strengthened in faith, guided in holiness, and comforted in life and in death. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. The congregation may be seated for our closing hymn, number 811, My Faith Looks Up to Thee.
morning again, and thank you for joining us for worship. A special welcome to our guests. We're happy to have you with us, and we'd be honored if you'd leave a record of your attendance by either signing the Friendship Register in the Narthex or scan the QR code and do so online. I've got a couple of announcements for you today. First of all, stick around. There's Bible class this morning at 9.30 in the basement. Pastor Beauvais will be continuing the study of the book of Job, so join us for that if you're able then come back again this afternoon following the 11 o'clock service. There is a baby shower for our staff ministry intern and his wife. who are expecting any day, unless you have te- checked your phone this morning. Okay, uh, could, be, could be here any time. But I was encouraged to tell you that there is chocolate cake to in- add an extra incentive to come if you'd like. A reminder that this coming Saturday is the Men of Truth Conference. If you haven't already signed up for that, it's not too late. Go to menoftruth.org and and join us for that on Saturday at Martin Luther College. Then the following Saturday, we've got our Easter for Kids. You can find information in the bulletin to sign up to attend uh, the younger kids. And if the older kids want, we would appreciate extra help too, so you can sign up as a helper there. Following the Easter for Kids, we're going to do an Easter canvas. So you're all encouraged to help out if you're able. We're going to walk around the neighborhood and invite our neighbors to come and join us for our worship services for Holy Week. And then finally, in case you didn't get the email that I sent out, I want to let you know that I have received a divine call to serve at Grace Lutheran Church in Manitowoc, Wisconsin. It is not the same church that I already returned a call to in Manitowoc. That was first German. Uh, My wife has also received a divine call to be the preschool director at Jesus Lambs of Grace Preschool there as well. So we would appreciate your prayers and your conversations as we both are deliberating calls now. Um, Keep us in your prayers, please. With that, may you go rejoicing in the life that God has given you when you were dead in transgressions and sins. You are now truly alive. God be with you, friends, until we meet again.